Hello, and welcome to Inside Cancer Careers, a podcast from the National Cancer Institute. I'm your host, Oliver Bogler. I work at the NCI in the Center for Cancer Training. On Inside Cancer Careers, we explore all the different ways people fight cancer and hear their stories. Today, we're talking to Dr. Brian Rivers of Morehouse School of Medicine, and after the break, Dr. Tiffany Wallace of the NCI. Listen through to the end of the show to hear our guests make some interesting recommendations and where we invite you to take your turn. One of the goals of the National Cancer Plan is to eliminate inequities by eliminating disparities in cancer risk factors, incidence, treatment side effects, and mortality by providing equitable access to prevention, screening, treatment, and survivorship care. On this episode of Inside Cancer Careers, we're talking to two people engaged in this work. Our first guest is Dr. Brian Rivers, professor and director of the Cancer Health Equity Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. Among many prominent roles, He has served as a member of the National Institutes of Health National Advisory Council on Minority Health and Health Disparities. He's a behavioral scientist with a focus on health disparities, funded by the NIH and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. Welcome, Dr. Rivers. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks for the invitation. So, Dr. Rivers, what are cancer health disparities, and what is health disparities research? So, health disparities research... um, basically is, is, is poised to help us examine and better understand, you know, why cancer disproportionately impacts certain populations more so than others. Um, and so we see these differences. Now, differences does not necessarily mean a bad thing, but when you look at it from an equity standpoint and you see the disproportionate impact um, upon certain populations, um, you know, the question begs itself, you know, why are these populations suffering more from cancer and the various types of cancer in comparison to some populations who are faring very well? This could be in terms of incidence, in terms of prevalence, or in terms of mortality. And so those are sort of the uh, epidemiological factors, if you will, that we um, use to, you know, monitor our progress and look at trends in the field and then, you know, decide, you know, what the approach should be um, to help um, address some of these um, adverse cancer outcomes that we're seeing. So the Cancer Health Equity Institute at Morehouse, um, which you lead, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What is the, What are the strategic goals? Uh, what do, do your investigators work on? Sure. And so the Cancer Health Equity Institute is nestled within Morehouse School of Medicine. It is located in the uh, great city of Atlanta, um, in the great state of Georgia, in the southern U.S. corridor. Um, it, it's surrounded um, within um, the Atlanta University complex, um, where you also have Morehouse College, Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University, and Morris Brown um, College. And so um, there, there, there's a nice ecosystem of, um, of, of intellectual thought, if you will, um, for the furtherance of the uh, betterment of all humanity. Um, and so here within Morehouse School of Medicine, Uh, We uh, pride ourselves on being able to lead in the creation and advancement of health equity um, toward health justice. Um, In a similar vein, congruent with the overall uh, vision and mission of this institution, the Cancer Health Equity Institute is purposed to help better understand uh, those those factors that are associated with adverse health outcomes among you know, populations that um, are within our catchment area. And for our catchment area is primarily comprised of African Americans um, and then Hispanics. And so, uh, you know, we have investigators that are focused on uh, basic science, um, um, foundational um, research. We have investigators that are, you know, focused on clinical research as well as population science. So we tend to cover the entire spectrum. And many of these investigators are funded through the National Institutes of Health, whether it's the National Cancer Institute, uh, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, or uh, NHLBI or NIA, uh, just to name a few. And so these investigators are, you know, exploring either, you know, within their respective domains of science or even um, through a transdisciplinary approach. And that's one of the um, approaches we foster here within the Cancer Health Equity Institute. You know, a little bit different from your um, NCI designated cancer centers, of which we hopefully will one day attain um, that designation. 
Um, but, you know, we, we, we tend to help foster, you know, cross collaborations um, across the different sciences, as well as with um, across different disciplines, realizing that, you know, the, the, the health disparities conceptual model is multifactorial in scope, meaning it's just not one's, um, you know, uh, genome. Is that, that, that that's really um, you know impacting these adverse health outcomes, or it's not just one's place of residence, or their neighborhood, or their community in terms of why they're experiencing these disparities, or it's not just you know having um, you know um, um, horrible access to quality cancer care, but it's a combination of these factors, and that's how we um, you know pride ourselves in trying to study um, this very very complex phenomena, um, looking at all different factors that may be associated with these adverse outcomes, and then studying them collectively, but then also um, appreciating uh, what we can learn individually from them as well. So we're leading in the advancement and creation of um, cancer health equity um, through translational uh, research as well as a focus on the other domains of research as well. So this multidisciplinarity of your research program is really interesting to me. And on the podcast, we're very interested in sort of um, examining all the different kinds of investigators and, and uh, you know, knowledge workers, if you will, who can contribute to the fight against cancer. So uh, do you have um, everything from sort of bench basic biologists to economists? What, what other disciplines are in your teams? Uh, so we have a wide variety of, um, of different disciplines represented. We have immunologists, we have biochemists, uh, you know, we have um, cancer biologists, uh, we have uh, physician scientists um, in the lung cancer space, in the OBGYN space, uh, in the breast cancer space, uh, and then we have population scientists, behavioral scientists, epidemiologists, um, policy an um, analysts. We have individuals that are looking at legal epidemiology. I'm looking at the role and impact of state and federal policy, to, which is all, the, our ultimate governance structure for um, society, and how they help propagate um, or, or serve as barriers and or facilitators to um, health access um, at the community level, but also within the institutional level as well, and try and address those factors. And so a wide variety, a wide swath of multidisciplinary investigators, all purpose to come together collaboratively. So it takes a lot of you know professional humility um, to come together to um, and serve as an MPI, for example, of an R01 grant, realizing that you bring a, a strength that, you know, collectively that is much, much greater than what you can bring in um, individually as an investigator. And hopefully that increases the time in which we're able to better understand, you know, some of these pathways to disparities and address them um, to save lives. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do, um, address the burden of disease, but then at the same time help save lives. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it, it, it sounds incredibly fascinating to, I can imagine being part of one of those teams alongside all these different colleagues could be a really interesting way um, to, to, to engage with this important question. Um, you mentioned a moment ago a term, um, health justice, and I wonder if you could just help us or help me understand what's the difference between health justice and health equity? Yeah, definitely. So health equity is basically giving individuals what they need in the amount that they need it at the time that they need it. And so providing these portals of access, but really understanding what an individual needs. Health justice is basically the elimination of any structural barriers um, that may serve as impediments to the uptake of, um, you know, these discoveries once they're made, whether they're at the bench, whether they're within clinical settings, or whether they're even at the population level, such as different screening campaigns um, that may even be necessitated to, you know, really help foster early detection among a population that may be suffering um, from a screenable cancer. And, and so, you know, we, we, we try and remove, uh, you know, the barriers, or we try and address the context in which we find an individual battling cancer with, but then we try and get ahead of it, realizing that some populations that are increased risk for um, kind of different cancers for one reason or the other. Um, and, and so we, all, uh, we, you know, we want to be dutiful to make sure that we're addressing the context in which that individual resides in and removing those structural barriers, whether they're within the community or the where, uh, such as a free flow of um, information. And we saw this as a, a really prominent issue during COVID where there was just um, not the free flow of information throughout all of society, where everyone wasn't getting the message of the um, importance of quarantining or the importance of for the, vac um, the vaccine uptake. 
Um, and we also realize that, you know, especially our um, constituents in the rural areas, um, you know, there there there's still some trust issues with science and research. As we saw vaccine hesitancy really show itself in a prominent way, we thought we were making tremendous progress, especially at the population level. But COVID really revealed some, um, you know, some gaps that we need to continue to address um, in the field. I wonder for our listeners um, who may not be thinking about uh, health inequities sort of on a daily basis as part of their work, whether um, you, you could share an example. Um, I, for example, I know that the um, uh, uh, incidence and um, uh, outcomes of cervical cancer in uh, rural Georgia in African Americans and Hispanic women is, is different from that of people in the city. Uh, or, or another example, I would just love for you to sort of tell us a little bit about what that looks like at the human level. Yeah, I mean, and I, I mean that that's a great example within and of itself. Um, if I was to utilize an example that you know I'm very familiar with and we are currently funded to address is uh, prostate cancer disparities. Okay. Uh, for example, we see African American men are more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer than. Um, any other racial and ethnic group um, in this country. And we also know that uh, African Americans are more likely to um, die from prostate cancer in comparison to other groups. And the question you know, begs itself why. We know that when this disease is found early, um, survival rates are you know, incredible. Um, we look at I mean, 10 year survival rates, you know, are close to 100%. Um, and so, you know, it, it, uh, it's incumbent upon us to figure out, you know, why are individuals still presenting with advanced stage disease? Are they not getting the screening message? Do they not have access to screening? Um, what role does fear of diagnosis play? What role does fear of the health system play? And what role does fear of cancer in general play? Um, and, and then if you're residing in a rural area, you know, uh, what type of health system do you have available to you to help foster early detection? And if you need to address, uh, you know, an adverse screening outcome, you know, what kind of help is in place to help you navigate the complexities associated with understanding your cancer diagnosis, but then deciding what treatment is best for me? So with prostate cancer, for example, there's a number of options, depending on stage and grade of disease, that one has to consider um, as it relates to treatment. Uh, you know, this is not an easy uh, decision by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we've con developed um, informed decision aids, shared decision aids. Uh, we foster multi-level models that's inclusive of the patient navigation model, utilizing iterations of that um, to all evaluate the role and impact of these different strategies to help individuals navigate their way across a cancer continuum. Uh, it's challenging in urban areas. It's even more challenging in our rural areas individuals who elect to go on a radiation therapy. Some individuals in our rural areas have to travel up to three hours each way to Atlanta just for quality care. And I mean, many times, right, in a course of radiation therapy, it's not just one time, right? No, it's not just one time. Oftentimes, it could be three, four times a week over a six, eight-week period, yeah. which is extremely taxing for someone who perhaps may not have the um, employment flexibility um, to have that much time off from work. Uh, for example, if someone's working in retail and <laughs> their duty is to work a cash register, that is a very, very difficult task. And that should not impact your treatment decision. Right. You should not compromise your treatment decision based on, well, the distance is just too far and you know, I know it's quality care and it's probably the best care that, you know, um, you know, I could receive, but I'm going to have to settle or compromise because of the social determinants um, that I'm facing as it relates to accessing these cancer care services. And so that's just one example of, you know, how we utilize um, or how we understand, you know, the complexities of an issue, but then how we utilize a transdisciplinary approach to, you know, help engage. So currently we have, we're working with our uh, geneticists, we're working with our population scientists, such as behavioral scientists, um, as, as well as um, our um, outreach workers, our navigators and others, um, you know, to really help build out um, a strategy um, that not only addresses the individual, making sure that they're well informed and well equipped, but then also addressing the context where we utilize iterations of the navigation model to help them overcome the context and really access these services. And so it's a multi-level approach, again, realizing the complexities that often um, you know, are associated with many of the disparities that we see. Uh, I think we learned over the last 10 years that yes, 
knowledge is important um, mm -hmm. and, um, and impacting one's knowledge, attitudes and beliefs is extremely important. Um, but at the same time, if we really want to see behavior change, if we really want to see individuals take advantage of screening or really interface with the healthcare system in a way that produces, you know, better outcomes, then it's going to um, really necessitate an approach that takes into consideration how one navigates um, their um, environment. So many points of failure um, between, uh, you know, a, a, a person getting screened or a patient getting treatment. And, and we realize, and, and, and I think, you know, um, you know, the, the architects of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative realize the value of screening, realizing that we can really make some significant reductions in cancer mortality if we got people screened. And we know COVID, you know, really delayed screening for so many individuals as the health systems are overran with COVID patients. And so for two years, um, you know, and, and some say well, um, three, um, that, you know, individuals have delayed key cancer screenings, um, you know, guideline appropriate screenings uh, yeah. for a variety of reasons. And so, you know, some individuals are projecting that we may see an uptick in advanced stage disease as a result. And so if we're seeing that just in the general population, just imagine a population that has historically experienced disparities. I think those disparities would just be amplified. Dr. Rivers, uh, you are part of a um, PATCHI program. That's um, a program from our NCI Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities. It stands for Partnerships in Advanced Cancer Health Equity. Um, we'll be talking to Tiffany Wallace um, from CRCHD after the break. Um, your PATCHI is with um, Morehouse, of course, Tuskegee University and the University of Alabama, Birmingham, um, O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do with this grant? Oh, absolutely. And again, I just want to applaud um, Dr. Sonia Springfield, um, the visionary um, behind this initiative, um, the, 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 the tremendous um, staff at the Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities, my good friend and colleague, Tiffany Wallace. Um, she's just been great. Um, you know, Apache Partnerships to Advance Cancer Health Equity um, has been uh, probably uh, an initiative um, that was really intended um, you know, in, in a neat way um, to help raise the tide for all individuals. Um, it brought in institutions that historically were not really considered or envisioned in the National Cancer Act. Um, and so, you know, 50 years ago, it was a great mission, it was a great vision by the leaders at the time, you know, to, um, you know, foster and, and pass the National Cancer Act. And we know that that really gave rise and coordination and, and structure to our cancer infrastructure here in the United States. It, it helped uh, birth the NCI uh, designated cancer centers, um, state cancer registries, just to name a few. And so it really, you know, um, helped us better understand and address the issues that cancer brought with it. But there was unevenness in terms of, you know, which institutions were um, awarded NCI designation and why. And we're still working on that. As you know, that there's been many additions to the P30 application, which uh, basically gives into, um, an institution that designation of NCI, um, meaning that, you know, they're really doing a tremendous uh, job in addressing cancer from prevention um, through diagnosis, treatment, and then survivorship as well. So it's a really a testament to the type of research as well as the type of care delivery that these institutions are delivering um, to their constituents. So awesome program. But then realizing that some individuals um, in some states didn't even have an NCI designated cancer center, let alone a cancer center. Yep. And then there were some institutions that, you know, had tremendous, tremendous reach into populations that were suffering disproportionately from cancer, whether it was breast cancer and African uh, American women, or, you know, some Asian populations and liver cancer, or, um, or, or you know, uh, individuals in rural areas that just couldn't access proper screening services. And, and so the idea, I thought, um, which was an excellent idea by Sonia um, Springfield and her colleagues, was to help formulate a partnership where you have these NCI designated cancer centers across the country, but what if we fostered a relationship with them, um, with minority serving institutions or historically black colleges and universities? And we know that these institutions have tremendous outreach into the community, given the demographics of, uh, of the student population of most of these institutions. These are the ones who we want to train and then hopefully go back into their respective communities and have a tremendous impact, you know, based on the skill acquisition uh, received um, within the halls of um, academia. 
And so the, the program fosters this relationship. So we are a triad, and we're one of the oldest partnerships in the country. Um, I think we're venturing in into year 17. So much so, though, um, you know, we're, we're starting to now, you know, better understand the impact. And the, and, the, and the true reduction in cancer-related mortality that we've had in the Deep South. Our data is that robust now, um, and, and, and we're continuing to learn. And that's one thing I've learned you know, throughout my career is that you just have to be a life learner because you know, so many things are changing. Our understanding is changing, how we address cancer, our approach is all changing. And so now I find myself working you know, with individuals from the National Bioethics Center at Tuskegee, realizing that now you know, I'm in the Southern U.S. corridor an area that, you know, is very familiar with injustices and in research, right? And, and so, you know, utilizing, you know, a bioethics lens to approach disparities is something that was new to me upon entering into this partnership. So I currently serve as, you know, one of the um, PIs. I'm the contact principal investigator at Morehouse School of Medicine for Apache. Um, as you mentioned, it's with Tuskegee, then O'Neill Conference of Cancer Center at UAB. And we're really trying to address a lot of the issues that we see in some of the poorest regions of the country, which is considered the Black Belt region, which spans from Mississippi to Alabama and Georgia, in primarily rural areas, high areas of persistent poverty. I know NCI just came out with an initiative. I was fortunate enough to be on that study panel reviewing the, on the, um, that particular initiative. Um, and, and so, you know, these are individuals that are in the context with depleted resources. But many of our HBCUs and our minority serving institutions have outreach into mm -hmm. these different areas because that's where the students are coming from, right. as well as that's where a lot of community education, community outreach takes place as well. So it's only natural that the partnerships that connect, um, you know, with these schools to help foster, you know, more robust research, more diverse participants in research, strategic outreach that really addresses the needs within one's respective catchment area help understand the data trends, so the epidemiological trends along the lines of incidence and prevalence and mortality, use that data at the state level to help inform state policy um, that then dictates the state cancer plan and or funding allocations, but even more so really help NCI better understand sort of the uniqueness of the catchment area in which you're working, then allow for the tailoring and targeting of your approach to really help address cancer within and of itself among all individuals, but then really detailing um, a strategic approach to those populations that may be suffering disproportionately from cancer, whether it's prostate, whether it's breast, whether it's cervical, whether it's lung, uh, whether it's ovarian, just to name a few. So the partnership has really, you know, been just um, a tremendous asset for my career. I started in Apache. I was trained through Apache. Um, and, and now to find myself in a leadership position is, is such an honor and a privilege that I really don't take lightly. But I really, you know, um, you know, consider this, you know, a, a golden opportunity to really make a difference and to really help advance the science. I want to return to one of your leadership roles. Um, as director of the Institute for Cancer Health Equity at Morehouse, what is your vision for the Institute? Uh, where is it going? And so we are actively recruiting um, nationally. Uh, we've been able to secure some tremendous talent over the last year. I really applaud the efforts of our uh, president and CEO, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, who was a trainee of Dr. Springfield's in, in the iCure program. Okay. And she gave her her first um, training grant, or research training grant. And, and so, you know, she's still in that vein of really trying to, you know, address, um, you know, a lot of the disparities that we see in cancer. Uh, I really applaud the work of our um, new dean from the University of Florida, uh, Adrian Tindall, all of his efforts and how he's been able to attract, you know, some new talent, especially in the cancer space. And so ultimately in three to five, maybe seven, Seven years, we hope to be, you know, the first uh, NCI designated uh, cancer center on the campus of an HBCU that's uniquely poised to address um, cancer health equity, um, leading towards health justice. And this should be reflected in how we train our learners of tomorrow, whether they're um, our biomedical students or whether they're our medical students or our physician assistants or our public health um, students. It should be reflected in terms of Morehouse healthcare or how we deliver care to the community. And it should also be reflected in our research pillar in terms of the type of research that we conduct. We don't feel that we are competing with other centers, but we are finding that niche 
um, that you know we have the the talent, we have the bandwidth, and we have the institutional support and structure to really advance health equity across all pillars. Learn um, the academia, clinical, as well as research, and so hopefully, you know, you know, we, you know, we will see that vision actualized. Uh, I know it's going to take a lot of work, <laughs> but we've been working at this for quite some time, and you know, I've really been socializing this idea with many of my colleagues in the field, and there's tremendous support. I'm um, just realizing where we're nestled and just the need, realizing that African Americans continue to experience the highest cancer-related mortality for most cancers, even though a lot of cancer-related mortality is on the decline for all populations. We're still seeing a disproportionate impact of certain cancers um, or, um, among African Americans, and so we think, given the heterogeneity of African um, Americans that we have here in Atlanta in the state of Georgia, that we have some unique contributions that we can render toward advancing science for all individuals, um, both nationally as well as globally. Sounds like an exciting time in your institute and at Morehouse in general. We'll be sure to put some links in the show notes so people can easily find um, your 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 uh, institute and maybe there's a job that they can apply for. Absolutely, a- a- absolutely. We've taken all comers, you know, especially those with um, NIH funding. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, Dr. Rivers, I want to pivot slightly uh, to another um, role. So, uh, we work together on the Science Education and Career Advancement Committee for the American Association for Cancer Research. You chair that committee. Um, you've also chaired AACR's Minorities in Cancer Research Council. And I wonder what role does AACR, big association of over 50,000 um, cancer research professionals, uh, what role does this organization play in the work of cancer health disparities and also in uh, promoting the diversity of our cancer research workforce? Yeah, yeah. I mean, excellent topics, Oliver. Um, you know, I just can't say enough about um, Dr. Marge Foti. Um, the CEO of AACR, the American Association for Cancer Research. Um, she has been tremendous um, to the field um, in terms of, um, and, and globally, um, just not in the field domestically, but also globally as well. She has really, you know, fostered and um, approaches that helps toward the prevention of cancer, but then also if you should find yourself with a diagnosis of, of cancer, you know, the best treatment that one can have um, through providing platforms for scientists and um, others to come and opine and, and share best practices and strategies, uh, recent discoveries, um, um, different approaches toward, you know, disparities. Uh, she's just been a leader in that regard. I mean, ACR was the first um, um, professional organization to really have a meeting uniquely focused on cancer health disparities, understanding the science of cancer health disparities among racial and ethnic uh, minorities. And that cancer, um, and that conference, we just um, celebrated 16 years of that, con- uh, wow. of that conference being in, in existence. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. Outside of the annual meeting, it's the second most popular conference um, that ACR um, actually hosts. And, you know, they host quite a few conferences. They do, yeah. um, and, and so, you know, I applaud Marge for just her vision. Um, and, and just providing, you know, opportunities. She's always evolving. Another thing that, you know, in positions of leadership within, a, within that organization that I've been able to, you know, really be a part of was the inaugural Cancer Disparities Progress Report, mm-hmm. which is produced, um, you know, um, um, uh, every other year. The, uh, the parent progress report is produced annually, and the uh, Cancer Disparities Progress Report is, is produced, uh, you know, every other year. So, um, you know, this is a tool that many of us use in the field. Um, this is a tool that goes to Congress to help shape, you know, federal policy. But then we also use it at the state level as well. And it's really just a report card to really uh, provide an assessment of the progress that we're making. We do want to celebrate progress. We don't want to, you know, always have the conversation from a deficit, but also, you know, from the assets, realizing that, you know, we've put a um, tremendous amount of resources toward this issue and that we're seeing the impact of that investment of resources. And so that's what the progress um, report really demonstrates, the progress that we made, but then the directions we need to attenuate to going forward. Uh, Marge has held several focus groups that many of us were a part of that really helped address some of the key um, factors that we know are in the field, such as clinical trial participation among diverse individuals. Uh, we had a, um, a think tank, if you will, um, in 2018 that brought together leaders from around the world to really help develop strategies and a plan 
um, to increase diverse representation in clinical trials. Um, I wasn't a part of a, a similar think tank, which really gave rise to the Cancer Disparities um, Conference, um, but many of my colleagues were. And so to find myself you know, in leadership positions now, I think is extremely meaningful. Um, it's a, a monumental task before us. I think you know very well. I mean, we um, serve on the Science Education and Career Advancement Committee. And, you know, that's the other side. You know, the research is extremely important. Um, and, and we really foster that NIH funded research, of course, um, you know, within the Cancer Health Equity Institute here at Martin School of Medicine. But workforce diversity is also germane, um, um, you know, to our approach as well. And, you know, working through ACR, we're able to attenuate that, especially through Science Ed and um, the Career Advancement Committee that we serve on, whether it's high school students, uh, whether it's, um, you know, undergraduate students, um, whether it's um, graduate students at the master or, or doctoral level, um, whether it's um, individuals that are postdoctoral fellows or folks in their residency, um, that organization provides such a unique platform for training and for networking, especially for those that are uh, pursuing careers within academic or government settings. Um, it really helps foster the professional development one needs to really be successful in the field. And so I definitely enjoy my time. Again, I consider, you know, these leadership positions an honor and privilege. And then I know the calling that, you know, we have upon us as a committee to make sure that we're meeting the needs of those individuals that, you know, are coming behind us and that will be leaders one day in the field as well. Yeah, and I'll just mention that ACR has an associate membership level, which is designed for people in those different um, career, early career stages that you mentioned, uh, students, graduate students, very affordable and gives you access to this tremendous network. Yes. I want to turn uh, to your own path. Um, you know, we're a career-focused podcast. So I'm always interested in, you know, what made you want to do the thing you do today when you look back even, um, you know, to your early years. What sparked your interest in science and in cancer health disparities, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm originally I'm from Buffalo, New York. Uh, parents transitioned to Atlanta. And Dad was in corporate America um, in, in the financial sector. And so that's what got us down into the South. A lot of families still upstate New York. Um, and so, um, you know, it, so when we moved here, it was, it was a bit of a culture shock. It was, it was, things were different, um, to say the least. Um, and, and, and the, but my mom is an educator as well, and so she's been a primary uh, school teacher for 40 plus years. Um, and so there was always this, you know, fostering of um, education. Um, I always just had a knack and interest in science. Um, you know, I don't know if that stemmed stem from my interest in Encyclopedia Brown books, and I love mysteries and trying to solve the mystery before the end, the end of the book. And, and so always looking to, you know, looking at a problem and trying to find solutions for the problem has always been a knack, and I think science parallels nicely with that. My love for mystery books and or mystery movies and, and, and science, where you identify a problem, but then you have to research and find a solution. And so growing up, I had chemistry sets and microscopes. You know, I mean, I love the science fairs. I mean, I built solar, you know, ovens back in the 80s where I was out manipulating, cool. you know. I <laughs> uh, did the, the traditional volcano understanding, you know, chemical reactions with baking soda. I mean, I just, you know, love science. And, and, and you know, just and I was able to foster that through high school. I went to a magnet high school. I was focused on engineering. My initial focus was uh, biomedical engineering. Um, went to Frederick Douglass High School, uh, a public school here in Atlanta. Uh, from there, you know, I transitioned to uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I was a biology major, and my exposure just opened up tremendously uh, um, at Vandy. I mean, I had tremendous exposure here in Atlanta um, through, um, um, you know, high school um, as well as elementary. Um, but Vanderbilt just opened my eyes up to the world and saw the possibilities um, that um, were endless. Um, and how I framed and looked at careers totally changed. And I, be, I began to do more volunteering as a result because I was intrigued by better understanding, you know, these different careers that historically I had not been exposed to. Um, and so, you know, I moved from engineering, of course, biomedical engineering, to more into just pure biology. And mm -hmm. it was fascinating. And botany was wonderful. We would go out, 
you know, in the woods and learn what plants you can eat and what insects you can eat, you know, and it was just fascinating. I really cool. enjoyed it. Um, um, and, and, and so I began to volunteer. I volunteered at Meharry Medical College and TSU and Fisk and um, through the church that I was attending at the time, um, you know, within Nashville and just got exposed to public health. And then I started seeing, you know, how some populations are faring. I, I really came to a head when I volunteered in the VUMC, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, um, you know, uh, ER and, and, and the type of um, you know, uh, accidents and tragedies that were coming into uh, many or because of just poor management of disease or undiagnosed disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just striking. It was an alarming, um, you know, uh, phenomenon that was happening. So I graduated Vandy, came back, pursued a master's in public health. Was I got exposure through public health um, in Nashville. So I was at Morehouse School of Medicine, um, second um, class of their, um, at the time, brand new um, public health program. Um, and the miles were further and widening. I mean, we, I was part of some NIH grants that took me across the entire state of Georgia. I was part of the governor's honors program. Um, and again, just seeing just the need outside of Atlanta that existed as it relates to um, health and wellness. Um, and and for, even from a prevention side, you know, really, you know, struck a chord with me. And so I ended up, um, you know, doing a genogram, if you will, um, in one of my classes. And, it, and the task was to um, go and do sort of a mapping of your family history, but w detailing their health history. Huh. And, if you, and if you could get the information, detail what one particular relative died from hmm. or as a result of. Mm -hmm. So doing that, I started seeing uh, this common thread of cancer in the family. Hmm. I was like, wow. And then I saw prostate cancer. I was like, huh, what is that? I was a biology major. I, I didn't really focus on the prostate gland that much in biology and anatomy. Or, um, and so, you know, doing more research um, led me to discover that, you know, certain populations are disproportionately impacted by prostate cancer, and there's still so many unanswered questions mm -hmm. in terms of the why. So I ended up doing a thesis on prostate cancer uh, while I was enrolled in the public health program. And it was just an epidemiological study, just looking at knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs toward prostate cancer screening. And lo and behold, so many people had never heard of prostate cancer, let alone a prostate gland, let alone prostate screening. Wow. Wow, this is incredible. Uh, you know, these are like life-saving guidelines that you should be familiar with. That are you interfacing with your healthcare provider on a regular basis? And so, you know, did the thesis and then ended up getting recruited over to a PhD program at UAB, University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. I was in the Department of Health Behavior. Again, got tremendous exposure to the black belt. I was actually down in Selma doing focus groups. Um, Selma, Alabama um, is a very, very um, historical place. But I was down there doing focus groups, working on a grant um, at the time. Uh, Dr. Mona Fuad was a PI of analyzing a gap between black and whites um, as it relates to prostate cancer. So I did some focus groups with um, uh, providers, trying to understand, again, barriers and facilitators. Got recruited out early of my PhD program, um, working with um, my mentor, Dr. Lee Green. Um, you know, he was recruited to Texas, so he ended up in recruiting me to Texas A&M, where I got involved in HEDART, um, a health disparities consortium that was head, um, led by Lovell Jones and others. Hmm. Um, and, and again, really, really took off in the disparity space. I think right around the time uh, David Satcher passed some um, national legislation as Surgeon General um, during um, Bill Clinton's administration um, that really gave rise to a center at um, NIH um, for to study uh, this phenomenon called health disparities, which is still very new. I mean, again, we knew the outcomes of the Heckler Report during Reagan's administration about the uh, excessive deaths that take place among blacks and other minority populations. Um, but, you know, there was just the Office of Minority Health, I think, at the time that had been developed to help address some of those issues that were in the Heckler Report. But then when David Satcher came on board and passed a key legislation and really helped inform some infrastructure at NIH to further develop um, and stand up. Um, you know, it, it was just an, an incredible time of free flow. John Ruffin and others, Science Springfield, other leaders at NIH, you know, really began to put our phase out. And I really saw a path forward for me as a career because prior to, I was told that could be an add-on 
um, health disparities research, but that cannot be your mainstay, and we do not know if you choose the academic route, if that will suffice for tenure and promotion. Wow. Got recruited out of, uh, finished up the PhD and got into a postdoc out there in Texas, then got recruited to Moffitt Cancer Center, where I was on the faculty in the Department of Health Outcomes and Behavior under um, the leadership of Paul Jacobson um, um, and Tom Sellers. Uh, Bill Dalton was a CEO at the time, and just sitting down talking with all of them. Um, you know, it was just incredible, their passion, their drive, um, their innovativeness, um, and just their approach to addressing cancer from, from a prevention framework as well as from a control and treatment framework was just incredible. And so I was on the faculty there for about at least 11 years before I got recruited to Morehouse School of Medicine, where I met Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice serving on the National Advisory Council for NIMHD. Um, and from there, you know, she laid out her vision and this is about 2014 of, you know, we really need a cancer center to help galvanize resources and talent to really address the complexities. Because she's just, she was so tired of hearing all of the disparities that she knew as a physician could be prevented um, that were resulting in people um, dying from the, um, from the disease. And so, uh, you know, that was, my, that was my track. That was my trajectory of where, how I got here to where I am today in my understanding of the field from a research perspective, but even more so a workforce diversity perspective. I think the both have to go in alignment if we really want to see a, you know, a change in the field. You've really seen a tremendous change then, positive change in, in, in your area of interest, right? I mean, it, it, Absolutely. it, it didn't exist in, it, in the way that it does today, even 20 years ago. And um, uh, well, that's that's phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that. I wonder then in that context what advice you might give to people listening who are maybe just exploring or beginning to understand what health disparities research is. And if, if they're interested in this, what, 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 what could they start by doing? I mean, there's tremendous resources at the National Institutes of Health, um, NCI in particular. Um, there's a number of programs that individuals could, you know, be a part of at uh, any stage they are, whether it's high school, whether it's undergrad, whether it's, um, you know, grad, um, you know, your center, Oliver, um, the Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities, the Eye Care Program, all of these are programs to help foster insight into having a career in cancer, whether it's at the bench, whether it's at the bedside, whether it's at the community, or even a policy level. Um, so you have to reach out and get involved. I always strongly encourage individuals to network at conferences, you know, oftentimes, we're so intrigued by the location of the meeting. We go in, we have our presentation, or there's a poster as the podium, but we fail to really take advantage of the context of the meeting where we're networking, where we're meeting program officers. Um, you know, instead of sending those emails, trying to get them to respond, many of the program officers at NIH, especially in CI, attend these meetings and are there for multiple days. And so, you know, I would strongly encourage individuals, you know, to value the, 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 the strength of networking. And in, in, in identifying um, through networking mentors, and you shouldn't just have one. I'm a strong believer, and I've always been trained that you should have a mentoring team um, of at least five to seven individuals. Some you talk to monthly, some you may talk to once or twice a year, and everyone serves a different role. One could be, you know, your scientific editor. One could help you just sort of envision, you know, and strategize, and others could just be for professional development. Uh, whatever role that particular person plays, it's good to have them part of a team uh, because the field is changing so fast. And, you know, it, it, there's a strong need to foster team science. And no one wins, you know, just, you know, I'm the Lone Ranger and I, I'm going to go out and cure cancer tomorrow. But it really takes collaboration, it takes partnering, and it takes, you know, a, a certain level of humility um, to really help address these issues. And so that would be my advice, you know, take advantage of conferences or any public gathering of, you know, um, thought leaders, uh, such as yourself, Oliver, um, that, you know, can really help shape and, um, you know, your, your, your path going forward. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Roos, for sharing all this great information and, and your own path with us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Stick around. After the break, we'll be talking to Dr. Tiffany Wallace uh, of the NCI's Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities. The NCI wants to hear from you about what we are doing to support early career cancer investigators. We've released a new request for information, or RFI. It's entitled Inviting Comments and Suggestions on the National Cancer Institute's Support of Early Career Mentored Cancer Researchers and Trainees. 
NCI is committed to supporting the training and development of the next generation of the cancer research workforce, and we're seeking input on our existing approaches and your ideas for innovations we might explore, all designed to improve how we support you. We invite suggestions and comments on all the career stages we support from middle school, high school, undergraduate, and graduate studies through postdoc and fellowship to early research independence. NCI is interested in your opinion and how our grant awards are structured and positioned and whether they could be improved to meet the needs of a diverse cancer research workforce. Your feedback on this matter would be greatly appreciated. Responses are due by December 29, 2023. We'll put a link in the show notes, but for questions, you can also contact us at NCI underscore early career underscore RFI at mail.nih.gov. We look forward to hearing from you. Okay, and we're back. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Tiffany Wallace, a colleague from the NCI. Welcome, Tiffany. Pleasure to be here. Dr. Wallace is a program director in NCI Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities, where she serves as the lead for the Disparities and Equity Program, DEP, and works to coordinate and strengthen NCI's overall cancer disparity research portfolio, encompassing basic clinical translational and population-based research. Before the break, we spoke to Dr. Rivers about his work in health disparities. So let's jump right into NCI's engagement. Tiffany, what is the DEP and how does it address this field? So the center that I work in um, at the Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities has a really large mission uh, and it's split between two areas. The first is promoting cancer health disparities research Uh, And the second is to focus on diversity training and workforce diversity. And so my role uh, within the DEP is focused on that first part of promoting disparities research. Uh, As an aside, this program is going to be evolving into a full-fledged branch soon, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. But our charge is really to develop and advance research programs that address cancer health disparities and to promote health equity. And so in addition to building our own research initiatives, a huge part of what we do is to work collaboratively across all of the divisions, offices, and centers at NCI. Uh, We're interested in research that spans all research disciplines. So uh, from basic to pop science to clinical and across the whole continuum of cancer. So from prevention through um, diagnosis and treatment, survivorship, and beyond. And so really collaborating and coordinating across NCI is is very key to what we do. You mentioned a moment ago uh, the word branch. That's a little bit of NIH lingo. That's like a a department, right? Yes. uh, Right now it's a a little bit more of an informal program, and it'll be a little bit more of a formal branch soon. So early on in our uh, podcast, we had um, a couple of program officers uh, on the show. And so um, we've talked about how program officers interact with grants portfolios. Uh, But I want to make sure I understand the way your group, soon to be a branch, uh, interacts with all these other groups of program officers in the divisions and centers you mentioned. So are you holding those grants or are you working together with those uh, folks to hold the grants in those divisions? Well, a combination. So, you know, our our program certainly holds our own programs and research, and we manage those grants. Uh, And then we work together collaboratively across the divisions. They hold the grant, but we certainly work um, to help make sure the initiatives have considered health disparities research and, um, you know, to help manage the the product of the research. So why is NCI interested in health disparities research? Health disparities are a huge area. I think this is a a bit of an evolving field. It's still relatively early, um, and there's a lot to be accomplished. But I I do think that it's something that whether or not we can eliminate completely, we certainly have the power to significantly reduce health disparities. Um, And so we're making progress. We have a lot more to go. But um, it's such an important issue that affects so many people in society. So you've already alluded to the sort of breadth of your portfolio and the portfolio across the NCI and the challenges facing um, people engaged in this work, right? I mean, there are some significant systemic challenges. How do you measure progress and what does that look like? 
Well, that's a difficult question. You know, certainly we can look at small benchmarks. Uh, we can look at the amount of research we're supporting and, and see the impact of the publications coming out. Uh, you know, I think really measuring progress is going to see that the rates of um, cancer incidence and the poor outcomes that we're seeing disproportionately across populations is, is where we're really going to be able to measure success. And you know, we see some incremental and sustained um, progress in this, but like I mentioned before, there's so much more that we have to accomplish before we really can even start to say we've made an impact. So if you, as you think about the portfolio, uh, what are the main areas of engagement right now that, um, that are most important that you, you feel are going to make the most impact? Well, I think, you know, so much of what research that's been done in this area has been done largely in silos. So basic researchers have been focusing on biology uh, and, you know, other population focus has been looking more at the epidemiological data and then community-based and engaged research is looking, you know, specifically at the community. I think to see progress, um, you know, we really need to be better intersecting these factors that contribute to disparities and take a more um, complex approach to, to what we're doing. We're making investments across all different areas, as I mentioned, different disciplines, so basic biology, population science, clinical, and we're making some significant advancements in these areas. What I think what we really are trying to focus more on now is, is embracing the complexity of health disparities, where we're better trying to incorporate you know, some biological aspects with social science aspects, um, with more clinical aspects, and put them all together with a real eye on including the community um, in the development of, this, of these research proposals. So I, I think that's where we're heading and where we're going to see some real improvements. Your mechanisms, your portfolio consists of research, um, academic folks learning and researching and understanding mechanisms and underlying factors and so on. How do you then take that information and make sure that it transforms how healthcare is delivered or, uh, you know, the outcomes in the community? Yeah, I mean, our goal, I think, is to collect as much information to understand what the causes are for health disparities and to try out some in, um, implementation science and see what sort of interventions can be useful. But I think that, you know, all we can do is provide the information. We don't control policies, but, you know, we have to hope that what we're finding out provides enough information that we can start changing some of the policies that might be at the root cause of, of some of these disparities. And so we continue to, to make progress uh, and hope that it makes an impact. NCI is also increasing its investment in this portfolio, um, has been for the last several years. I'm sure that's going on across the country. Uh, what, what are you, what's your impression of the trends in cancer health disparities research, say, over the last five or ten years? Yeah, so as I alluded to before, I, I think the trends are really starting to see these multidisciplinary approaches, these large kind of system science approaches where we're really trying to get different disciplines um, interacting and speaking with each other. So, you know, we know that biology is not a driver of disparities, but, but perhaps is a contributor. Um, we know that largely the drivers are social determinants of health and, you know, impacts from environment, but, but getting these these different aspects of um, science to interact and to really make the big picture clearer, uh, I think that's where we're heading. And if I could uh, ask you to project maybe five or ten years into the future, where do you think we'll be? Well, I think we'll have, we'll have moved beyond identifying what the disparities are. Um, maybe we'll be a little bit further in developing some sustainable interventions. Um, and starting to have a better understanding of the root causes and, and aiming our interventions more at, at not just fixing the problem we see, but, you know, getting to s interventions that could perhaps stop the problem from, from starting. That sounds exciting, and um, I hope it comes true. <laughs> uh, me too. You know, I, I don't know. Five years was a short time. Sure. sure. <laughs> Maybe a little bit further out, but it's the direction I think we're all hoping to head. So I understand you also uh, oversee a portfolio of grant mechanisms promoting basic and translational cancer research and initiatives uh, to stimulate research in underfunded areas. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that work? 
Yeah, so when I started um, my role in the center, I took over a program that's been around for you know quite some time. It started in 2010, and that's focused on basic research in um, health disparities. This is a collaboration with DCB, Division of Cancer Biology, and DCP, Division of Can Cancer Prevention. Um, it's really focused on understanding the biological contributors of um, disparities, a focus on, on more of the mechanistically focused studies. What's been interesting, though, is that since this started in 2010, we've really seen this program grow and evolve with the field. You know, as I mentioned, we understand biology is likely not a driver of disparities, but maybe just one contributor. And so it's been great to see that many of the proposals coming in and being funded have more of a focus looking at these social determinants and the environment and investigating how these factors are getting under the skin, you know, influencing biology, not just looking at germline risk factors. Uh, we have some other programs with a, more of a focus on translational research. Um, so this has been two programs I'm very proud of that I started working on um, early in my role in CRCHD. I really had an interest to see some basic research findings translate better into the clinic or you know, relate to public health. And so through some very strategic collaborations, mostly with the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis, uh, we had these, these two programs start up about 2018. Um, the first is, is the PDX-NET, right? This, this is a, a network that was designed to uh, advance precision medicine research What's efforts. a PDX, sorry, for uh, our audience? A, a patient-derived xenograft. And so this is an, a patient um, um, a cancer model that's derived directly from a patient tissue. Uh, and the network in, in general is designed to um, do this collaborative development of these patient-derived models and then use these models, kind of like a little mini clinical trial in animals, to test these therapeutic agents that are very targeted. Because um, the PDX models are much more faithful to the human disease, right? Exactly. They're, they've gone much further than a traditional, you know, cell line, um, and they incorporate some of the heterogeneity that you see in, in the tumors, um, and they're, they're kind of shown here in the animal model. And so the goal of this network is really to help us with a, a prioritization and a rationale for what, what sorts of agents should be going into early phase trials. And what we did is we joined this network, and we fund a few of these centers that have a real focus on developing models from um, underserved or underrepresented populations to, to increase representation of these models that better reflect the community. Uh, and also they're asking research questions on, you know, why do we see some therapeutic outcome disparities and better understand what might be going on there. So I'm super excited that we just got reissued and it's starting a, a new round of research. Um, it's been very productive. Uh, another area, you know, that we've been working on are with the SPORs. The, the research um, specialized programs of research excellence. For this, we've collaborated closely with the translational research program, which is the home of the spores. Uh, if you're familiar with this program, they've been around for over 30 years, uh, and the hallmark of it is um, translational research. And so most people, when they know of a spore, these are large pres prestigious grants, they're organized by the organ site. So you might know a, a breast spore or a prostate cancer spore. Um, but they also encourage programs to focus in on more thematic areas, so like addressing health disparities. Uh, but despite disparities being a real priority area for the spores, we haven't had a spore with a focus in on health disparities. And so we started a planning grant opportunity to help these investigative teams c get more competitive um, in, in making a, a application focused in on addressing health disparities. In total, we were able to fund 12 um, planning grants, and, and they span so many different cancer sites and different populations, wow. and we're super excited to see you know, where they go. So traditional spores, I used to be part of a, a brain tumor spore before I came to NCI. Um, traditional, traditional spores are groups of projects that are all translational, as like you said, and they're trying to head to the clinic, right, or they're connected to the clinic. And the idea is that the project sort of mature out of the spores as they become clinical trials and new projects come in. Is that the same way that you're constructing the health disparities spore? Exactly, yes. You know, they have the same requirements. Um, 
and they're doing early phase clinical trials to try to address these research questions. Now, we, we haven't had a full score come in even yet with these planning grants um, to date, but the TRP um, is leading a new RFA, and hopefully we're going to see more. These are going to be, you know, just like a regular SPOR, but using um, a cooperative agreement mechanism um, and to see some of these research questions related to health disparities and minority health um, be investigated in this program. And that's the translational research program that's going to issue a request for applications, just to uh, expand yeah. on those acronyms. Acronyms. Um, I'm sorry. I said, not at I all. Speak federal. <laughs> uh, yes, it's it's part of our DNA, which is <laughs> deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, those are also, that sounds like a great new program as well. Excited to see um, what happens there. Um, you have many roles at NCI, Tiffany. You also serve as the co-chair of a working group um, that's part of NCI's equity and inclusion program. The working group is called Enhancing Research to Address Cancer Health Disparities, obviously something near and dear to your heart. You work with Dr. James Dorshow and Dr. Werder McCaskill Stevens on that. I wonder um, t what is the focus of that group, or obviously the title it suggests it, but what, what, what have you been up to with that working group? Yeah, this working group is very overlapping with the work that I do in, in depth that we talked about, and I couldn't have been luckier than to be teamed up with Dr. James Dorshaw and Warden McCaskill-Stevens. I mean, they're just notable names and such impact in the field. You know, some of what we've done um, has been focusing on soliciting input from various thought leaders um, and community members about you know, what recommendations they have for helping us to advance the field of disparities and promote health equity. Uh, and we've had uh, some other activities more focused on supporting research in the area um, that we thought were very important, things like how we could better increase clinical trial diversity and um, how we could advance persistent poverty research agenda, which is a big focus right now. Um, at, within the NCI. And so we have a, a bunch of other activities in the works, you know, looking a little bit more maybe broadly at, at some policies that we could consider trying to encourage more investigators that, that aren't doing disparities research to still use an equity lens when they're putting their proposals together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we're, we're doing a lot of different activities that kind of all go in in different directions. I'd like to talk about your own path, your own career a little bit. Um, always fascinated to to learn how did uh, you know how people got into science. So, what sparked your initial interest in in science broadly? Well, I, I've always you know been a bit of a science nerd. I think we all share that in common. Um, this this goes back to elementary school, so it's not surprising that I chose to pursue this in graduate school. Um, you know, I did my initial graduate studies focusing really on like signal transduction work, cardiovascular, really far removed from anything clinically relevant or, you know, public health related. Uh, so for my postdoc, I really wanted to come and, and make it a little more personal, go into cancer research. I, I, think, I think everybody in, you know, by now has been touched by cancer in some mm. way. And, you know, I, I had that with, through some, um, family members, and so I was really lucky to join the lab here uh, at NCI with Dr. Stefan Oms in the Laboratory of Human Carcinogenesis, where he was, you know, combining basic research interests that I had, but with more of a molecular epidemiology slant um, to look at aggressive markers for prostate cancer and breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had this great case control cohort, and it was really wonderful to be able to look at these differences that we were seeing by, by ancestry and understanding why some patients were more at risk of prostate cancer and aggressive mm -hmm. disease than others. And so it really sparked my passion for, for understanding, you know, what the causes were, and it's really been um, the end of the story for me. I've just been growing and, and focusing in this field since then. So they, there is this um, saying that I've heard before, which is that when you think about your health outcomes, your zip code uh, is more important than your genetic code. So it sounds to me like you almost moved from the genetic code uh, to the zip code uh, between your postdoc and what you're doing today. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I firmly have one foot in gen <laughs> genetic and the other in, in the zip code area. I realize how important both of those aspects are, and, and really kind of combining it, I think, is 
is really key. So what uh, though triggered, uh, you know, you were doing your postdoc, you were interested in biomarkers. What then um, made you wish to, to transition both in terms of your role and what you do day to day and also in that shift in focus, if you will, from genetic to zip? Well, the, the focus from genetic to zip just happened organically. I, I don't think you can be working in the field of health disparities and not have uh, appreciation for all of the competing and complex factors that contribute to disparities. And so while my training and my passion is still very much in the more genetics side of things, um, I would only be able to take the field so far without kind of expanding. And so as part of the new branch, you know, we're going to be hiring and, and looking for program officers to join with unique and complementary expertise so we can, you know, work to get a better view of, of exactly what's happening and, and how we could better tackle these hard issues and hard problems. And then you, I guess that's the same reason then that you moved from a sort of right on the interface of research to being in a, in a program role. Uh, you wanted to broaden your impact, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I guess nothing's as simple as that. I, I knew from the very beginning I wanted to go into industry. I wanted to work at a biopharmaceutical company, and I did. Oh. I did do just that. I know. I after my postdoc, I went into a company, Human Genome Sciences. They have since been bought out by <laughs> GlaxoSmithKline. I I really loved it there, to be honest with you. So you know, it goes to show no one's career path is a straight line, right? For it sure. always takes its turns. Um, but you know, I, I definitely, um, I missed working in the field of disparities, uh, and I had twins at the same time as my company got bought out, and it made me do some soul searching, and um, coming back into the government felt like the right change for me, and um, focusing back in on health disparities just seemed like a, a really nice organic fit for, for what I wanted to accomplish. And an exciting time in the field with all that's going on, so... Yeah, I mean, it continues to, to get more and more attention, which is just wonderful. So then lastly, um, people listening uh, to our conversation wondering maybe how they could become engaged in health disparities research or how they could even just add that lens to their own uh, work. Um, what's your advice to our listeners? Well, if you're interested in doing disparities research, I, I wholly encourage you to go for it. You know, all research should be rewarding. Um, but I, I think doing this line of work just is truly special. Uh, you know, there's a real need for, for making an impact in this space, uh, and we have a long way to go. I think, as I mentioned, we're kind of at the early stages of this field and a lot more to learn and grow. If I were to give advice, it would be to be open to having diverse training experiences as you're getting more in tune with this area lean into the different disciplines uh, and, and really seek out collaborations outside of your comfort zone or what would seem traditional for you to do. We really need data scientists working with basic researchers and staying in tune with the social scientists and really prioritizing and incorporating the community into all the research. And so I, I guess that would be the path forward is, you know, don't stay too focused keep an open mind. And what might, what might some resources be that our listeners could access? We uh, talked to Dr. Rivers um, in the first part of the, the show, and he, of course, heads a, an institute at Morehouse. So if you're at Morehouse, just go, um, you know, connect with him. But if you're, what about um, elsewhere or online things that you might recommend? Well, if you're just getting, you know, into this field or you, you really want to look at the state of the science, I think tuning in, um, if you're not familiar with it, AACR does a Cancer Disparities Progress Report. They publish this every two years. The first one started in 2020, and it's really um, a really comprehensive review of the field. Uh, and, and what I really like is they put some explicitly stated call to action recommendations in there um, that, that are just so important. And they, they intermingle it with stories from patient advocates, so it makes it very special. Uh, if, if you already know that you're into this field, you're looking for collaborators, then going to the AACR disparities meeting. They have one every year focused only on the science of health disparities. Um, they just had the 16th one earlier this month. Um, it's one I go to every year, and it's a great place for establishing some collaborations and, and hearing about the exciting things 
But it's a hot area. If you're interested in this, you can get a seminar on it probably weekly here uh, on really interesting topics. Persistent Poverty um, just started a new seminar series that's open to the public um, that I definitely recommend checking out. Those are some out. great great recommendations. So, we'll put links in the show notes as always. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Tiffany, for coming and sharing your insights and your experience. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Now it's time for a segment we call Your Turn, because it's a chance for our listeners to send in recommendations that they would like to share. If you're listening, then you're invited to take your turn. Send us a tip for a book, a video, a podcast, or a talk, or anything that you found inspirational or amusing or interesting. You can send those to us at ncicc at nih.gov. Record a voice memo and send it along. We may just play it on an upcoming episode. Now I'd like to invite our guests to take their turn. Let's start with you, Dr. Rivers. Okay, so my recommendation will be for everyone to familiarize yourself with the American Association uh, for Cancer Research, Cancer Disparities Progress Report. Again, this re report is produced uh, every other year, and it really helps explore issues and provides an action plan, if you will, um, toward um, addressing health disparities and advancing health equity. Um, so it's a tremendous uh, document covers many of the cancers, covers workforce diversity, covers research, care delivery, recent advances in the field. Um, it, it just really gives you a nice comprehensive overview of where we are in the field and what needs to happen. And um, I, it really helps um, attenuate and highlight a lot of the great uh, funding that NCI has put forth toward helping us better understand cancer, but most importantly, um, eliminate cancer. And so I strongly encourage, it, encourage everyone, um, if you haven't uh, familiarized yourself with the AACR Cancer Disparities Progress Report, please do. You will not regret it. It's a great recommendation, a great way to start um, learning about this field and, and what's going on. Thank you for that. Thank you, Oliver. Tiffany, what's your recommendation? Um, okay, so I'll admit I thought about this a little bit. Uh, I stream a fair amount of uh, TV series to unwind with my husband um, and just relax. And, uh, you know, one that I really like, I'm watching it currently, I'm only two episodes in, so, you know, more to come, is this documentary that's um, called Live to 100. I don't know if you heard about it, Secrets of the I have Blue not Zone. heard of this. No, interesting. So, no? Oh, it's very, it's very interesting. So they, they've done all this work previously to identify these areas they call blue zones that have higher uh, frequency of people living over 100. And they're trying to understand what gives people in these areas longer, you know, longevity. Uh, and, and looking, it's a lot of what they're finding is what you would think, links to diet and uh, exercise. But... Some of it's a little bit more interesting, you know, some of the differences on lifestyle or social circles or philosophies, and uh, it's always good to hear some recommendations on how to improve your health, and uh, my kids sure. even like it at 11 That's years cool. old, so I, okay, I would Okay, thanks. We'll, uh, we'll dig that out and put a link in it um, uh, into the show notes as well. I'd like to make a recommendation as well. It's uh, for a new book from Dr. Jorge Sham, who's, I think, famous for his PhD comics, um, Piled Higher and Deeper. You, a lot of people are familiar with those. And actually, I think in our very first episode, we had a recommendation for them. He's got a new book, and it's called Oliver's Universe. So I'm naturally drawn to it, of course, because of the protagonist has such a great name. Uh, but it's also f because it's funny, it's enjoyable, and it talks about science in a way that young people of all ages can enjoy. Uh, if you have a middle schooler in your life and are looking for a way to get them thinking about STEM, uh, take a look at this great new book. Oliver in the comics is 11, so that gives you an idea of the uh, of the age focus. So we'll put a link to that one as well. Um, and, um, you know, if you're listening and you want to send a recommendation in, please do so as well. That's all we have time for on today's episode of Inside Cancer Careers. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our guests. We want to hear from you. Your stories, your ideas, and your feedback are always welcome. And you're invited to take your turn to make a recommendation we can share with our listeners. You can reach us at nciicc at nih.gov. Inside Cancer Careers is a collaboration between NCI's Office of Communications and Public Liaison and the Center for Cancer Training. It is produced by Angela Jones and Astrid Masfar. Join us every first and third Thursday of the month 
when new episodes can be found wherever you listen. Subscribe so you won't miss an episode. I'm your host, Oliver Bogler from the National Cancer Institute, and I look forward to sharing your stories here on Inside Cancer Careers. If you have questions about cancer or comments about this podcast, email us at nciinfo at nih.gov or call us at 800-422-6237. And please be sure to mention Inside Cancer Careers in your query. We're a production of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute. Thanks for listening.